Good afternoon, Kansas City. Thank you for tuning in to another Restore KC virtual public program. My name is Paul Gutierrez, Director of Programs and Events for the Kansas City Museum. A quick update on the museum. Our staff and leadership are working really hard to reopen this museum, Corinthian Hall, this fall as a new museum of Kansas City history and culture heritage. In the meantime, we'll continue with these virtual programs. And this summer, my goal is to activate the lawn once again with outdoor safe distance summer concerts, programs, and events. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce you to a new friend and colleague, Michael Price. Hello, how are you, Paul? Hey, Michael, good, how are you? Good, very well indeed, thanks, very well indeed. Thank you for hosting this yeah. this afternoon. Of course, Michael, for those that might not know about you, can you tell me a little bit about yourself before we start the documentary on the Blue River, which I'm really excited about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm a, a filmmaker based in, in Kansas City. Um, I also teach um, video and journalism at uh, Johnson County Community College. Uh, my background, in fact, um, is with the BBC back in the UK. I moved over here. My wife is from up by Platte City. So at the end of uh, 2013, uh, we moved over here and um, settled here. And as I say, I used to be with the BBC. I used to work on their national... Uh, investigative program Panorama, uh, which goes out every week, half an hour program every Monday night. And since moving over, I've tried to continue, or well, have continued, making uh, documentaries, uh, sort of for the most part, investigative documentaries. So um, there's one I put out a couple of years ago called Evicted about the lack of affordable housing. There was Our Divided City that went out at the beginning of 2016. Um, and then last January, January of last year, um, I put out this um, this film, the Blue the Blue River, uh, with the Heartland Conservation Alliance and the Nature Conservancy in, in Kansas. Great, thank you for sharing that. Before we get our um, program started, our document documentary, I will let the audience know that if you have any questions or comments, just drop them in the box below. At the end, we'll have time for Q and A to ask Michael any questions that you might have, and also to reminder that thanks to One Kansas City Radio, this um, program will be available in the podcast. So Michael, you want to introduce your, your documentary? Yes, it's uh, well, it's called The Blue River. Uh, and so it's about this um, this exquisite gem of an urban stream, uh, which starts off in in Kansas, in Johnson County, and then swings around the, um, the south of, um, of, of Kansas City area and makes its way up through the industrialized sort of northeast Kansas City area before meeting the Missouri River. It's about 40 miles in length. It tells a very interesting story, I think. It tells a story about, about the Kansas City area and about where we are as well, people, where people are at the moment, I think, with, with the way we interact with nature. But it, it speaks for itself. All right. Everybody enjoy. Tuning. That's kind of figure that I got for just rolling down the river. <laughs> Nature is beautiful and peaceful, and uh, we've got to protect it. This is her voice. She is not like us. 
She has not one voice, but many. She was here first. We built our cities around her. You may have glimpsed her as you zoom by overhead. This would have been tree-lined and shaded and full of houseboats. But there are those who go beneath the bridges, who want to find out more. And there are those who have always loved her. I got to the camp at Standing Rock for three days, and I was an experience that, that changed my life. In a way, and she has many ways, our story is in hers. You can find yourself here, or here, or here. So let us journey with her and meet some of her friends along the way. You never know what you're going to find on a river. She would like to make a friend of you. She is water. She is river. She is the Blue River. All this water that rains here, rains over all this area, runs down to the Missouri River and drains. She has beginnings, small beginnings. The water that lands on your concrete, the spring from beneath the white oak. All of it flows and our story begins. There are those who believe it needs to be told. No matter where you are, you're downstream of somebody and the things that you do here affect people downstream. So there's that circle. Because we believe it's not just about connecting with nature, but it's about connecting with one another. Because it's, it's all interconnected. And that's what we're doing here is we're connecting the children together and with nature. Ooh, do you know who used to live at this river? Black Bob, have you anybody heard of Black Bob Road? We're down at Brush Creek near Truce, where Truce cross over, and we're gonna try and retrieve uh, one of the little electric scooters. I, as I was riding by on my bicycle the other day, I saw one of those scooters down in the water. And this is actually in the valley of the Blue River, where the headwaters are. This river started by two creeks. Do you guys know what creeks Wolf they Creek were? And Wolf Creek. Coffee Creek and Wolf Creek. The Blue River and its creeks do not conform to the grids of our maps. They are blue veins that should nourish our land. Well, we've, as a family, been involved in cleanups, but just to bring them down, get outside for the day, and to help be shepherds or stewards for this water that, that we all use, or hopefully use. I don't know about this water, but. <laughs> so I grew up going to the Blue River, and what I find interesting is that when I, when I remember my life, the memories that are most vivid are at the river and outside in nature. I don't remember playing video games much, and there's something to that. My senses are stimulated. I'm fully alive. My blood's flowing. I'm running. I'm playing. And that's what we provide the kids. You don't have to focus on anything else but having fun. You can get exercise. Can collect things and learn about them. And the sunshine. Like I notice shapes and rocks. I just feel so relaxed and free. I just enjoy being in nature. The river is something that's wise that shows me something that's a spirit to me. Yeah, it's still down there and we can't get it out. We're gonna have to retreat, come back with a bigger hook. In her flow, in her coils and pools, there is life. The seasons impress her, a harmony of rhythms, and she drinks deeply. Where would we be without water and her secret generosity? She dances with light. Is it a tippier? Like my it really isn't. That's the nice thing about it is they're so self-balancing. So we're getting ready to put in on the Blue River and take a little kayak ride down the river. I got this last summer when I was um, in Minnesota. So you can take your phone with. 
We're near my property at the beginning of the Blue River, and it's so exciting because we have this group of amazing environmentalists that are working on protecting the Blue River. Well, we have a friend who has never canoed before, or at least kayaked. She's been in a canoe, so she's a little worried that she doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> I am nervous, um, mostly because I am not a skilled kayaker, but that's not going to stop me. The Blue River is invisible, and this portion of it in particular is invisible. And much of this land still hasn't been developed, so we still have a chance to save some of these beautiful areas. <laughs> but only if we get going, because development is moving fast. Yikes! Okay, here we go. People love this until it's gone. <laughs> Over 50% of the Blue River's watershed is on the Kansas side of the state line. Rainwater that lands here will eventually flow into it. So we are on Camp Branch, which is a headwater tributary to the Blue River. And the headwaters of the Blue River are on the Kansas side of the state line. The main stem of the Blue River flows into Missouri where it joins the Missouri River. This is a male orange-throated darter. This river is in generally good condition. It has good water quality, good dissolved oxygen levels. We have this rule that the valley rules the stream, and the valley for Camp Branch is generally healthy. Lots of healthy forests, lots of healthy grasslands. The Nature Conservancy and its partners are working with some local landowners to protect these headwaters. But not far from here, the city of Overland Park in Kansas is growing rapidly. And as the ground is sealed off, the earth cannot drink the rainwater and it runs into the rivers. In urban areas, we typically design them to shunt the water out as fast as we can. The water runs over pavement, it runs into the stream much faster, there's nothing to filter it, and in fact, it picks up pollutants and heat from the pavement. It may be that increased runoff is contributing to the erosion of the banks. And you can see along some of the banks here, there's pretty massive erosion going on. And uh, that's kind of a result of development we have in stormwater. These have fallen because of all of the flooding. So the tree roots get exposed because the banks of the river are being eroded. It's nice to be with a group of people who are so animate about protecting the water and nature because we're all gonna need that as we go forward. So right behind me is Wolf Creek, and we've just been paddling on Coffee Creek, and they come together or confluence right here, and this is where the Blue River starts. It's right here. For the Native Americans, where two rivers come together is a very important place to pray. They, they would send their prayers down the river, and so it was considered a sacred place. The Blue River flows for a little over 40 miles from Kansas into Missouri and through the east side of Kansas City. Along the way, it's fed by creeks such as Indian Creek and Brush Creek, and it all flows into the Missouri River, which started in Montana. For some of its passage through Kansas City, the Blue River runs through publicly owned parks and woods, and it offers adventure. Oh, hey, hey, come here, come here. The grass carp right here. All right. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be chasing these fish on Indian Creek where it meets the blue. Now these fish are very, very skittish. They require a lot of patience, a lot of time. It'll probably cause you a little frustration too. Yep, they're gone. What can you do? Oh, they're called carp. Common carp is out in the middle tailing. We go on foot. Uh, you're gonna see a whole lot of brush here. We gotta kind of bushwhack through some of this stuff. You coming? You know, a lot of people are starting to get into this kind of fly fishing thing. And it, it's usually associated with trout. 
That being said, anything you can do on a conventional rod, we can do on a fly rod. I don't care if there's an interstate above us. You got beautiful water, crystal clear. Usually you're not getting bugged by people. Uh, some of those trout rivers, you're fishing shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> Went right next to him. He didn't even look at it. Oh, that's a big catfish. What the heck? That's not even a grass carp. <laughs> that's a good fish. All righty, back he goes. Well, it's not what I expected, but I'll take it. We're here at the middle part of the Blue River Trail system. I like doing the dirt because you can just turn yourself inside out and just leave everything on the trail. Total effort and you know go as hard and fast as you can. Oh sh you good? get out to the Blue River Trails for me from my house or from my work, it's about 20, 25 minutes. And it's pretty awesome to think in that short of a time you can get to an area like this. It's not like you want it to be a, a best kept secret, but at the same time, you know, more people should be experiencing it because it's really beautiful out here. <laughs> Spring rains are a good time to get trail work done because rains a lot and you get a little too wet to ride so you come out and build trail work kind of what we're doing today it's one thing to have good trail that's fun to ride but it's also you know humans are suckers for beauty and views <laughs> and you get the some of the best views by the river look at that water's moving fast and so when we were laying it out we made sure to get some places where we could get up and see the river i mean these woods were so unused before we started building trail in them. Part of my hope is that by building trail, people get back here and have access to the nature. And then, you know, that prevents the county wanting to do something commercial with it because it's a value as, a, as an outdoors activity and green space for people in the city. You know, I think today everything's about, you know, go, 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 and everybody's busy and short-timed. For me especially, uh, nature is kind of my way to, you know, to come out and be at peace with myself and uh, really appreciate the, the world that we live in. Recent research suggests a two-hour dose of nature a week significantly boosts health and well-being. It's going great. It just feels so great to be out here. I just, it's amazing. It's not really about the catching. I've gone many, many a day without catching a fish and had the best of times. So it's, it's about just getting out, enjoying nature. I know right now we're kind of in the city, but I could walk half mile that way and you would think we're in Colorado. However, nature is not always allowed to be pristine. All right, so this is just kind of a warning. There's a chemical here, PCB. You don't want to be drinking the water. I know that sounds really obvious, but I see a lot of people doing it. Uh, don't eat the fish out of here. It's catfish, are you kidding me? Probably not a good idea to swim. You know, if you get in the water like we are, you know, we're doing ankle deep stuff, just take a shower, you know? And then it became invasive and just basically kind of gets into everywhere. Every fo forested area is filled with it. Invasive bush honeysuckle is choking the forest. And the trail builders face other challenges. This stuff wasn't here at all, you know, when we laid this out a couple months ago. But you can see someone just came and just flung it right down the hillside. You know, it's just a little defeating. You want to come have fun and build trail, and then you got to spend a lot of time picking up trash. The battle against the trash and pollution has gone on for decades.
This is the Prospect Bridge near Prospect and Blue River Road in Kansas City, Missouri. And if you look over this bridge, you'll see a flap gate. You can easily see the difference between the water quality coming out of this flap gate and the water quality of the river. And as for you, O oh my flock, does it seem a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must trample down with your feet the rest of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the rest of the waters with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trampled with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Are we better off now than we've been? Now that we live behind glass, downstream of the filters, safe on the inside? Isn't it outside where we find fellowship with ourselves, with others, with whatever is at the root of it all? Perhaps it's out here where our better nature lies. The blue is the biggest and the most important of Kansas City's urban rivers because stormwater drains into the blue carrying all of those pollutants and one of those pollutants is trash. This is the Blue River Rescue. We do this every year and uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of people come out and just uh, clean up the park and there's free donuts and coffee. So if we can have a thousand people picking up trash in one day, that makes real gains for that river. When you see people with such beautiful hearts, they, uh, they just come out of the woodwork and all they care to do is to make the world better. When I was a kid, you know, we were outside all the time and you know, it's just kids these days don't get an opportunity for that. So for them to be outside climbing a hill, lifting rocks and getting trash, it's a win-win both for them and for the river. We don't just want to build empathy between people. We want to build empathy for our planet for our water systems. If we don't do that, we have no hope. I don't know that anybody's put their canoe in here. There's not an official boat ramp, so we're, we're kind of faking it. The river starts near the Overland Park Arboretum, which is where we were a little bit ago, and it starts to become more and more urban. Here's the zoo. And then if you look, here's the plaza. Brush Creek is one of the main tributaries. And we're right here. Today, we're right where Brush Creek flows into the Blue River. So we want to see what the river looks like here. All right, are you ready? I am not, but I'm going anyway. <laughs> It'll be fine. That's right. OK, here we go. At one time, the river here would have flowed through farmland. All right, so this is the confluence of the Brush Creek and Blue River. You know, you're in the city farm at this point. The prison was up on top of the hill, and this was a working farm. And it grew a lot of the food for the city and became the center for where they grew a lot of the products that went into the sea rations during the war. You can't come down here and not have your blood pressure lower. This isn't the beauty of the south side of the river, where you have the forest still intact and everything but there's something about water, bodies of water coming together like this. As the river flows north of here, again, its character has changed, and we interact with it differently. This was a giant resort area, and if you were actually in the northeast, the whole mouth of the river was full of houseboats and fishing, and, and in this area right here, you still had that. But it's just been paved, you know? We paved it and put in a parking lot. In 1970, the city of Kansas City partnered with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on a 40-year project to reduce the risk of flooding in Kansas City's industrial northeast quarter. The project did become greener, but in its early days, cement simply replaced soil and trees. This river doesn't look like much of a river here. It looks like a concrete ditch. And I knew that, but I guess I wasn't prepared for how stark it would be today. I noticed a few little damselflies up on the bank, but they can travel. So they probably came up from the confluence where there's some vegetation. It's just sad. It's just so sad. And you wish they could do something about it. And I don't know that we can, at least not for our generation. But the river has friends in high places, and they do want to do something about it. 
Momentum is building to redevelop the industrial area and for a healthy, accessible river to play its part in attracting residents and businesses. So the river today reflects the end result of the Industrial Revolution, our choice to separate ourselves from nature. If we look at this mirror long enough, we start to see the possibility for us to again see ourselves as an active part of nature. And we could envision this as a new kind of economic driver that would be based on what these natural systems offer, which would include, of course, removing all the concrete. I think without any question, this can once again become blue water. The story of the Blue River is still being written, and we don't know yet what the next chapter will be. In its pristine headwaters, in its woods and parks, in its industrialized lower reaches, changes are afoot. And as we write the story of the river, we're also writing our own story and the stories of those who will come after us. Actually, the thing that inspired me the most was listening to music about rivers. Like, what would be the specific song of the Blue River if the Blue River had a song? You know, all these big signs, Mini Wachoni, you know, the water is life, and it was just like, wow, it's like so beautiful. So today is our fifth annual Martin Luther King Walk. It's a nature walk, and we wanted to plan a special event to honor this great leader. It is a river that is a connection between Missouri and Kansas, and Missouri is notoriously a slave state and Kansas is notoriously a free state. And so it makes you kind of wonder like, how many slaves may have crossed this river into free territory or what songs were sung here? A lot of people don't know the Blue River exists in Kansas City also. So our biggest mission is showing people that the Blue River can be beautiful and it can be exciting and it can be a wonderful place to visit. You know, all these rivers are connected together. As the Native American believed that they're the, the lifeblood of the earth. Sing a slow, shallow dirge, a spirituals of muddy streams, songs of ancient dusky rivers, churning carp on seas of dreams. Sing the same songs sung by solemn travelers of the past, trudging across the River Jordan, hoping to be free at last. We no longer know our rivers. As a people, we are lost. Booming industries of burden, streams no soul can swim across. Pollution of our rivers is connected to our plight, since we too are made of water. Water is our source of life. Reconnect with our great rivers, walk their banks and learn their names. Sing their songs so we'll remember that their life flows through our veins. At this very moment, while you're watching this, rivers are flowing. All of them flowing into each other, flowing around us, flowing beneath us, flowing through us, doing their work. They are connectors, and what we do to them reflects us. They want to offer us life. More storms are coming, more flooding, more development, more people. Those things are real and they threaten this river. At some point, we've got to change how we view nature, specifically rivers. Michael, I, I love that documentary. It was so aligned. It was it's so aligned to what the museum here is doing. 
Um, on the second floor is where the um, visitors will come learn about the history of Kansas City. Yeah. And the first gallery that we titled is called Culture Confluences, Rivers to 1870s. And our team of historians and educators came up with that title. So this document fits perfectly on how the rivers is the intersection of the start of Kansas City and how we became the city. Yes, yes, yes. Tremendous. Yeah, and I also love too the the fact I was thinking here watching the documentary, the the museum is all all about the new museum is all about the untold stories of Kansas Cityans and their contributions. But while watching your documentary, that about there also is untold stories about nature and the river. Um, a question that came up was like, why do you why do we need to tell the stories about the Blue River? Well, because they they haven't been told before. Um, it's, it's part of the reason, um, and um, it's a well-kept secret. I mean, okay, you're not turning on the TV and opening up the newspaper necessarily and seeing something every day about the river, okay, but it's there, and, and it's difficult to get to, and not many people, you know, know how to, to get to it, what to do once they get there, actually, to be fair. So, I mean, what we what we do know, of course, and this was, this was referenced in the film briefly, is that from research, extensive research that's been carried out, scientific research. Uh, if human beings spend time every week, I think it's about two hours or so, in nature, uh, it, it, they get something from that. It, 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 it improves their well-being. And, and so when we, when I found out that we've got this beautiful gem of a river kind of hidden away on our doorstep here in Kansas City, you know, I was thrilled to be able to share its story, and I hope as well to through sharing that story to encourage people to go and interact with the river right? and to spend some time down by it to fish to paddle uh, uh to walk beside it to cycle beside it and, and and you know to get so much from it as i did in making the film you know. right and what do you think other stories about the river can tell us about our own health and our purpose in life yeah i think that's an interest i mean when i was the early days when we, we were kind of brainstorming this this film and how to uh, how to make the film and what the film should try and do and there are a number of us involved including you know Kelly Blanford from the, the Nature Conservancy in Kansas and there's Jill Erickson as well you, you meet in the film from the Hartman Conservation Alliance and Evan Small as well the environmentalist you know, a whole it's a whole group of people and we were saying well you know, how can we tell this story and, and what's this story, what should this film try and do? And, you know, I know it's a bit bit of a cliche, it's a bit corny, but we were thinking about the river as kind of reflecting back on us. Mm -hmm. So so we wanted we wanted the film to do that as well, to give us chance, people watching the film in the Kansas City area. Actually, I mean, it's a story that's probably relevant to a lot of cities in the US and right. wider afield, you know, and how, and how we treat our urban streams. You know what does this say about us when we look at the river and the river you know conveniently enough you know from the filmmaking perspective kind of helped out because first of all you know i've mentioned some names some names there but there's hundreds of other people i mean literally hundreds of other people who really care about the river mm -hmm. and are very enthusiastic about it so i've got a whole pool of people who i can draw upon you know to get advice uh, to find out you know, where the nooks and crannies are, places I should be filming, and to, to get interviews. But also, the river is, it, it was convenient in the sense that it's got like three chapters, ongoing mm. chapters to it itself, two, three different sections. So you've got the headwaters in Kansas. We saw some of that, you know, that's where they begin paddling. We mm. get a sense of pressure starting to build upon those headwaters as development is being you know uh, housing units are going in around them and the ground is being covered in concrete and tarmac what that means for runoff mm -hmm. then running into that section of the river then we've got the middle section of the river which is just it's wild it's like something you might find in you know like california uh, california in, in colorado or you know montana even it's I mean, it's not mountainous but it's wild so it's got these big wild forests as well there no, no footpaths. <laughs> you know, the, you saw the, the guys hacking their way through the forest, uh, and then you've got the north. You know, the sort of the more northern reaches as well. The um, the lower reaches of the river, where it's very difficult physically to get to it, um, and it's surrounded by high wire fences. 
and you know even for a section it flows over concrete and you know what what we're able to do in the film i'd like to think through hearing the stories of those who have got this passion for the river who really care about the river who interact with the river know something about it but also through you know in part through their eyes but also you know just spending some time down by the river as well we get to see those three different ongoing chapters mm -hmm. we can ask ourselves well you know, what do we want the river to look like and what's happening to it at the moment and hopefully as well this is something that's very precious we need to protect it right in your interviews with those individuals is there a story that stood out to you that kind of like wow i had no idea i have some and i'll share with you what i learned watching your documentary but anything that you captured yeah i mean um i think the uh, the, the 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 idea that at one time there were houseboats on the river you know uh is that what you were going to say paul that's what yeah yeah and it's, it was quite a startling uh find really those postcards showing showing pictures of, you know, this was um, this was a, like a holiday resort. Well, now that section of the river, as I say, you can't even get to it. I'm not sure you'd really want to. Right, um, right. Because it's not very pretty there. Uh, it's not allowed to be pretty. Um, but that, for me, was quite a quite an eye opener. And you know, some people out there uh, are determined that it can return to that state. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you know, they they they've got this idea as well that if it were to return to that state. Then it would attract people and people would want to have their business in the locality and spend time you know lunch break on a, on a beside a beautiful river and people want to live beside a beautiful beautiful river and go jogging beside it mm -hmm. but that that's uh that's that's where they like the, the river to get to in that, that in that section of it. no that was my like i'm like what that, I, that postcard was like i that really happened in kansas city northeast but that was a shocker to me yeah. um I will tell our audience if you have any questions for Michael, just let, drop them in the box and I'll share them back to you. Uh, we did get some comments. Um, Malcolm said, thanks, nice documentary, inspirational. Megan was said, um, learned so much. So thank you so much for that documentary. Um, what was your initial goal when you were creating the Blue River? And did that goal change or tell us a little about that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, as with any, any Kind of film production documentary film production certainly you're never fully in control uh of, of, of what can happen you just got to go excuse the pun there may be a few puns in this talk you've got to go with the flow mm. uh, but we as i say we had this brainstorming session there where we kind of mapped out on a on a, on a, on a piece, big piece of paper there um ideas and i think i think the main idea really was well let's try and give the river a voice so that's why you've got those sections, uh, three sections or so, where the, you just hear the narrator, the Jamaica Kendricks, the narrator, her beautiful voice, just talking um, and trying to trying to give the river a bit of a voice. But as well, of course, we we can hear something of of, of, of the river's voice through the voice of those who interact with it. Mm -hmm. And as I say, you know, there's a whole range of people who, who do that, who interact with the river. And I was trying to spot the choice really, but. Uh, spending some time with them the the fly fishermen for example mm -hmm. uh you know the the, the the earth riders the poet um you know and, and and capturing something of their interaction with the river of course is bringing the river to life um and as i say you know hopefully showing us how we can interact with it and all that can be gained from doing that as well for us the future generations no i love i think uh, uh poet nika is that correct yeah. is that correct yeah, I love what she shared that she just imagined um, the slaves that were crossing over the river and what th those songs came about in that journey that they had. So just kind of just a different perspective of what the river played in those individuals' lives back in the day. That's the thing. I mean, it, because, you know, again, I was talking earlier about the idea of the river sort of reflecting back on us. It reflects back on us individually as well. It means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an extraordinary angle that she had, which until she started reciting the poem or talking about a poem I, I hadn't realized that of course that's the case and so there is that history mm -hmm. desperately important history to this to this river well what does that then mean how do we celebrate that how do we respect that how do we unearth that properly and, and share that um well that's why she she's she's in, in the film delivering that amazing poem do you feel michael that maybe this documentary could create or advocate for some policy change? I mean, the images of the illegal dumping and the trash, 
I'm not sure what, if any follow-up has been happening for the city, but any policy change or, or anything like that that, might, that you know about or that might come about? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, the trash, as we said, the film has been going on for, for decades. Um, that that kind of every every spring, I, don't, I think it was cancelled last spring because of the pandemic, but every spring, hundreds and hundreds of people go out and volunteer their time to, to clear up the Blue River. And, and my understanding is that over the past couple of decades, that whilst that effort's been running, they have been collecting less and less trash. Okay. Uh, they're still collecting a lot, yeah. but it's not as bad as it was. It seems like gradually it's moving in the right direction. Now, mm -hmm. could you speed that process up? Probably. I mean, first of all, encouraging people not to dump. Also, mm -hmm. secondly, maybe the city could do more to collect, to provide services to collect mm -hmm. uh, large trash items and to help people, you know, get that trash out of their homes or off their out of their uh, driveways without them being tempted to put it in the back of the truck and dump it. You know, time mm -hmm. another thing. I think you have to. Pay, I think you know the city might, might be able to do more on the collection of tires, uh, removing any costs involved for people looking to to offload those. So yeah, but but you know it's our responsibility as well. Yeah, we can clean it up, but hey, you know let let's share the message. Right. Let's not dump our trash. Think about. Okay, some people, you know, dump fridges and sofas, but how many people as well finish a, a bag of chips and, and, and throw it out the car window or drop the coffee cup, you know, and makes its way into the gutter? Mm -hmm. now, ultimately, everything is in a watershed. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to yeah. flow into the river. Yeah. Unless no one picks it up and puts it in a trash can, it's going to make its way into the river. And that includes things like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk stuff, spend too long talking, but, you know, dog excrement as well. Yeah. what you spray on your yards okay lovely you don't get any dandelions on your yards but all that all those chemicals are going to flow into the, the local creek and into the river and that's not good especially you know in this part of the country where we, we take our water from the rivers right right now, what was your favorite memory of, of filming if you could pick one yeah um <laughs> well paul yeah there's quite a few um <laughs> I'd say, I, I was thinking about this earlier, I, I think really it was the chance to go down to a river that I didn't really know. I mean, I, I like rivers, I go fly fishing when I can. When I can. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, there's not a decent trout stream too close to Kansas City. But anyway, uh, I, I do like to go f fly fishing for trout. I like to spend time in cold water, clear rivers. And this was a revelation because, as you saw in the film, I hope, you know, parts of the Blue River compared to that. Uh, and there's actually some great fly fishing to be had on the Blue River, great sport to be had. But, but going down to the river by myself, usually early in the morning with my camera and a you know, clutch of, of lenses and spending time looking at the river close up through lenses for a couple of hours. At times it didn't feel like work. Of course, it is work in a way. But I tell you something walking back to the car, having spent a couple of hours doing that, just, you know, you just feel like a bit of a different person, to be honest. It's uh, just some sort of, you know, wash something away. It's great. It just calms you down, clears your mind. There's something hypnotic about moving water. Uh, and that's not something I've often done before, is, is gone down to a river or go to a beautiful piece of nature and just sat, just sort of sunk into it. And that's, that's what I was able to do and, and that was just it was a delicious experience, really. Approximate, I know it was a short film of less than 30 minutes, but for the audience who might not know the, all the logistics, just give us a, a, a time for like, from the concept to finish and then how much filming all that's to yeah. produce this video. Yeah, I can't remember how many tapes I filmed. I think each tape's about um, 90 minutes in length. I think there was close to 40 tapes. So quite a few hours of film. Um, a lot of the interviews that you see in the film may have gone on for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And just lifting a few seconds from the film, the best sound bites that do the most and keep the story moving along. So it's quite, filmmaking is quite, you know, labor intensive. Uh, mm -hmm. You're kind of boiling things down. You're looking for that, looking to distill things down to their, to their essence. Um, and so, I mean, you know, the, the entire process, uh, 
I think it took over, I think it took a couple of years because there was a taster tape as well that we made. And once once we got started on the film in anger, I think it took about um, about a year. To, to, and then that's that allowed me, of course, to spend a bit of time down on the river through the various seasons, through the four seasons, which mm -hmm. again you get to see in the film. You know, I think that that's right. you don't have to do that. I once made, I mean, this was with a, a big team, the BBC. I once made a film from start to finish in two weeks. Uh, by the end of which I was um, not really sure which way was up or down. I prefer to spend a bit of time, you know, making these things. But uh, yeah, this one took about, I think it took about a year, something like that. Is there a blueberry memory that did not appear on the documentary just because you were restricted? Yeah. To the time? Is there a couple yeah. that? Yeah, there's, uh, so uh, I'm always looking to chase action, you know what I mean? So we're, we came up with the idea of having people canoe, sorry, kayak, mm -hmm. kayak on the river. Mm -hmm. It's a good way of, you know, it gives me something to film, gets them on the water, the audience get to see something in the river, um, and they, they, of course, they start off in the upper reaches and then move down and see the three different sections of the river as they do that. And there was one, one person who was um, who was kayaking, her name Bonnie Chapman. Uh, she appears in the film, she, she, we hear from her a couple of times, I think. And she fell in to the river, I don't know, four or five times. And every time I just missed her. I was trying to film her. I wasn't asking her to fall in. But every now and again, suddenly, oh no, Connie's falling in again. And I, I'd hear it and I'd go running. And by the time I got there, there was nothing to film, you know. Uh, and uh, I never caught it. So that was, uh, that was something I, I regretted not being able to capture her because I think it uh, would have raised a few smiles. But uh, no, I mean, it's uh, uh, most, of, most, of the, um, most of the people who were interviewed are in, are in the film. Yeah, speaking of an action shot, I did like that bike angle of the bike, the, the angle of the bike going down the, the trail. Yeah, that was a, yeah. that's that's a good the, uh, GoPros, and little GoPro cameras, they're great. Yeah, we stuck, uh, I, put, I borrowed them um, from Steve, a guy, a friend called Steve Heather. I borrowed a couple of GoPros, and then I had one myself. We, I put three GoPros on those, and they just went off in the forest, and I saw them mm. an hour later. I went through the footage and thought, my, my goodness me, this is a bit hair raising, some of these. So yeah, I, I love how you weave that in there, that action shot. That was a good angle of what they're reviewing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those boys are, uh, they're a force of nature. They really are. They're, uh, they, I think they, it takes them about a year to hack a mile of trails. Mm. They do this by hand. I mean, they don't take a digger in there or anything like that. They have chainsaws and those picks and axes and teams. And, and um, when it's too wet to ride, you know, they don't have, tear up the trails they go in there and hack their way through these um through these woods and extraordinarily extraordinarily committed to what they're doing and those trails then are, are open to anybody you can you can walk mm -hmm. on them and cycle on them and oftentimes they they're choosing the prettiest way through the woods mm -hmm. they'll take you down to the river every now and again and it's um some of those sections of river where it runs over i think it's running over limestone or, or rock certainly it's, it's beautiful Go, um, what do you think it means to make the Blue River accessible for all? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that is a, that's, a, that's a problem that the river has at the moment. It's not accessible. It really isn't. And it's not accessible because you physically can't get to it for most of it. Right? It's not just a case of having to walk a bit of distance through a wood to get to it. It's that it's surrounded with these high fences. Or it, it runs through privately owned land. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying, Paul, that there is only one boat ramp onto the river. Uh, there are other places where you can get boats onto it. Well, one purpose-built boat ramp. So, you know, if, if the river is to become more accessible, mm -hmm. and it should be so that people can get down there and, you know, and enjoy it, as you've seen people mm -hmm. doing that, you know, we need to, we need to provide those access, access points. Flag mm -hmm. We need a map helping people. Uh, and as well, a big part of that is the water itself needs to be safe. You know, it's all very well providing people with access to get down to the river, but we don't want them doing that if, you know, the day before there was a big storm and it's full of raw sewage. Um, now, when I was filming um, in that section, you know, with all the concrete, I went down there by myself for one day and was filming down there. There was stuff I filmed which I couldn't put in the film, which is basically, I'm not going to give you too many details, but it's sewage-related. Mm. Uh, and... and um, you know, 
all very well providing a boat ramp there, but do people want to be paddling around with that? So, you know, there's a few things that need to be addressed, I think, before the river is accessible and safe uh, before you get kids down there or whoever. Right, so many layers. Like, I, I, I grew up in West Texas, and the Rio Grande River oh, runs yeah. off through Texas and the border of Mexico, and uh, some sections are very beautiful, but it's the access point. And how do you get to those access points? It's very beautiful. But then there's also the other issue of safety and the water and the pollution that is in that water that we don't know. Yeah, so. yeah. It's something that's um, unfortunately still to this day, so many rivers are used as basic sort of sewage outlets when there's heavy rainfall. So the water companies can't have that, that sort of rainfall backing up into the sewage plants. So it's just released. It mixes with the sewage and it's then released into rivers. And it's a, it's a problem. It's, it is a problem for the likes of the Blue River. I mean, uh, it, it can be very bad down there. Now, do, you, do you hope that you will make a longer documentary out of the footage you captured? I don't know, really. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's not something I'll undertake myself. I feel that that, that film kind of does justice to the story, really. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a temptation as a filmmaker to, to think, oh, I'll make a longer film. Mm -hmm. the films, as they get longer, aren't necessarily better, I, I don't think. I think that, um, I think for the footage I got and the story we're telling, I think 27 minutes is, is a sweet spot for this particular film. The film I've just made was, I think it worked out at 45 minutes, but that's a very different film. Mm -hmm. Lots of very, very personal stories, and you've got to give those personal stories time. This one, I think we um, hold people's attention, give them a lot of information as well, and tell a good story. I think 27 minutes is about the right time. That's my feeling at this stage. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I have two more questions, but um, when the when the museum reopens this fall, I would love I would love to have you me for an in person program. We will have a theater on the third floor that sits about 42 individuals. Um, for people who know the museum, um, the famous igloo back in the day, that's where the theater would live. Uh, but that'll be a theater for documentary, film, performances. So my goal as we open slowly here and safely is that to have a viewing again and have you come talk in, in, in person to our audience. Um, Michael, call to action to our viewers. Well, if someone's wondering like, well, what do I do? I don't know how to get involved. What's the first thing one can do? Well, I'm not. I'm not an expert on those type of questions, but I know people who are, and that's who I encourage people to get in contact with. So there is the organization, the Hartman Conservation Alliance, uh, and uh, they've got, they've done a lot of work on the blue. They're doing a lot of work on the blue. And of course, they commissioned this film. Um, their work is, is, uh, is well underway, and their website, the Hartman Conservation Alliance, you know, you can get in touch with them. They've got a lot of initiatives regarding the Blue River. Uh, also, as we, you know, we had, the, um, we had Heidi as well, didn't we, in, this, in the film from the Nature Conservancy in Kansas. Because mm -hmm. the thing, of it, thing about it is, of course, it, the wonderful thing about the river is it kind of straddles Kansas and Missouri. Uh, right. And you're talking about something that's flowing from Kansas. So we need to be thinking about, if you like, the river and the round. If you want to sort out the river in Missouri, well, what's happening to it in Kansas? Uh, and the Nature Conservancy in Kansas is... Um, monitoring the river very very closely and looking to protect the river and its headwaters as much as they can do and, and they they would really welcome i'm sure any sort of support as well um and the two organizations the Hartland conservation alliance and the nature conservancy in kansas i believe they're kind of working together they certainly did on this project this film project uh and there are great people there and, and, and with you know boundless passion and energy regarding the Blue River. That, that's certainly the, um, the two organizations I'd encourage people to Yeah, to. I totally agree. And I'll tell the audience that on our website, I, I will have links to those uh, two organizations because uh, this partnership is with the Heartland Conservation Alliance. Um, that's why we're bringing, we're bringing this program together and we hope to bring them back for, um, for more programming as well uh, in the future here as we reopen. Um, I have one final question, a personal question. From outside of the media, art, and storytelling, what do you enjoy outside of filming? Okay, what what do I enjoy filming outside of? Oh, well, yeah, outside of filming, what 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 do you enjoy? Oh, what do I enjoy doing? Um, 
Well, I've got two very young kids, and they take a lot of uh, a lot of time. Um, what do I like doing? I like uh, I like reading, uh, and I like running, and I like cooking as well. Um, and uh, really, off the back of the, you know making this film, I like exploring what we've got. You know, in Kansas City, it's pretty extraordinary what we've got very close to us, and and these gems, and trying to find other little little creeks and woods and. Mm -hmm. You know, so Missouri's got some amazing state parks. I've got to say, Kansas, you know, hasn't got the same number of state parks. I think I'm not the same. It's got some beautiful spots um, as well. So I like taking, you know, going out there with the family and um, picnicking, swatting away the mosquitoes and uh, uh, taking a flask of tea. Have you been to Matfield Green? No. I would look it up. It, it, it's in the foothills. There's some beautiful little creeks out there. It, it's a beautiful space uh matt field green Nothing. i would recommend it oh, thank you yeah well michael it's almost time uh, i want to thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story and your documentary and giving a voice to the blue river and telling its untold story uh, my goal is to hopefully have you back in person and debut also the film on the in the new theater on the third floor uh, so thank you so much and also thank you to heartland Conservation Alliance who brought us together. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Once again, thank you to our audience. I really appreciate you allowing us to enter your home or office, wherever you're at today. Uh, my name is Paul Gutierrez, Director of Programs and Events. Uh, thank you to One Kansas City Radio who provided all the tech behind the scenes. And also to them, this will be also available in the podcast. Once again, our goal is to have these virtual programs at least twice a month until we hopefully come back this fall for in-person, indoors events. Uh, in the meantime, visit kansascitymuseum.org. That's kansascitymuseum.org to learn about the upcoming programs and events, what's happening with the renovation and restoration of Corinthian Hall. And hopefully we'll see you again uh, in this setting or on the lawn this summer, or for sure, hopefully, fingers crossed, this fall at the Kansas City Museum. Thank you so much and have a good Thursday and have a good weekend. Enjoy the sun.